Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, final event of the first full day of the Howenstein Center's 2017 Conservative Progressive Summit. I'd like to uh, begin our roundtable on politics, journalism, and the digital age with just a few brief introductions of the really wonderful participants who've joined us here in Grand Rapids for this installment in our gathering. Our conversation this evening will be moderated by none other than Joseph Hogan, who's already a familiar face to many of you in the crowd tonight. He's a former program manager of the Common Ground Initiative at the Howenstein Center. Joe's the one who uh, taught me all my ways. So currently he's host of the Howenstein Center's Common Ground podcast in which he interviews writers, uh, critics, and scholars about the shifting political and intellectual and cultural landscapes of American life with a new episode every week. Joe is pursuing an MA in English and American Literature at New York University, where he is a Charles Wickham Moore Fellow and co-founder of NYU's Intellectual and Literary History Colloquium. Now on to our conversationalists. Winston Elliott is president of the Free Enterprise Institute in Houston, Texas, where he also serves as editor-in-chief of the online journal The Imaginative Conservative and visiting professor of liberal arts and conservative thought at Houston Baptist University. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Washington College and an MBA with honors from the University of Houston. Ingrid Gregg served as president of the Earhart Foundation from 2004 to 2015, having first joined the foundation staff as a program officer in 1998. Following Earhart's successful sunset, Ingrid currently serves as a trustee or officer on several nonprofit boards, including the Harry S. Truman Scholarship Foundation, the Foundation for Economic Education, and the Archbridge Institute. From 2015 to 2016, Ingrid was president of the Philadelphia Society. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Edinburgh and is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Daniel McCarthy served over six years as editor of the American Conservative, where he is now an editor at large. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, The Spectator, The National Interest, Reason, Modern Age, and many other publications. Outside of journalism, he worked as internet communications coordinator for the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign and as senior editor of ISI Books. He's a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis where he studied classics. Sarah Leonard is senior editor at The Nation, an editor at large for Dissent Magazine, and an editor emeritus of The New Inquiry. She is co-editor with Bhaskar Sunkara, a co-panelist, of The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for a New Century, published by Metropolitan Books. David Marcus is literary editor for The Nation and also an editor at large for Dissent. A doctoral candidate in history at Columbia University, he was a Richard Hofstadter Fellow from 2010 to 2015. His research interests include modern political thought, the history of social movements and political institutions in the North Atlantic, and American intellectual culture. He contributes essays on politics and literature to the New Republic, Book Forum, N Plus One, Le Monde, uh, and other places. Bhaskar Sunkara is editor and publisher of Jacobin, which he founded in 2011. A leading magazine on the American left, Jacobin offers socialist perspectives on politics, economics, and culture. The print magazine is released quarterly and reaches over 25,000 subscribers, in addition to a web audience of over a million a month. He is co-editor with Sarah Leonard of The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for a New Century, and he's also editor of the ABCs of Socialism, published by Verso just last year. So with that, I'll hand things over to Joe. Thanks very much, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Scott St. Louis, program manager, as you all know, of the Common Ground Initiative. Thank you as well to Gleaves Whitney, director of the Howenstein Center, for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel uh, about which I am very excited. Um, last year, I helped to co-organize the Progressive Conservative Summit. I was basically in Scott's shoes. And I remember <clears throat> being sort of behind the scenes and being really excited, uh, really exhilarated, because Gleaves and the Center had managed to bring together a diverse group of political thinkers and writers to sit at the same table and actually exchange ideas and debate productively. And that was, of course, exhilarating. Um, I also had a great deal of anxiety, perhaps even terror, because I was young and I uh, was very much intimidated by this group that I was with and also um, just really acknowledging the fact that it is hard to come together and debate about the very rifts in our political culture that in many ways we saw cast into high relief 
in election 2016 in, in many ways that we're working through today. So I really do want to applaud uh, Scott, of course, who, with whom I can most empathize uh, right now uh, because I was in his, yes. Thank you. But, but then also, uh, Gleaves Whitney um, and Anne and Morgan and Liz and Chad and Kadar, the newest member of the Howland Sense and our staff, uh, for all the work that they're doing. I think that they're, you know, it might be premature to say because we're only halfway through this conference, but they're pulling it off with characteristic aplomb, which is, uh, I think, testament to their professionalism and equanimity, but also to the fact that they have managed, again, to bring together, uh, I think, a terrific group of people to debate and to discourse. Um, Again, I should express my gratitude for being able to moderate, or rather put questions to this particular panel. Uh, I read or follow the work of everyone on this panel. Uh, I think you probably do as well. And I think that in, in each panelist, what you find isn't just a vital critique of politics and policy in America, but also a critique of culture, a really productive critique of culture. And in many of their work, you find an articulation, I think, of an alternative in many ways to perhaps the political status quo, um, certainly to politics and business as usual. So I'm very excited that they've managed to find the time to come together to have this conversation uh, with each other as well as with the audience. So um, after I put some questions to them, I'll invite you to come forward uh, for Q&A and put some questions to them as well. Um, I think as we sort of work through the meaning of election 2016, uh, both the good and the bad as we each um, understand them, uh, I think we're going to be looking to these writers and thinkers. Uh, and with that, I'll actually transition to my first question for the panel because it is about the election. Um, I'll put it to the whole group. Um, I suppose we'll just start over here and sort of move, uh, and then we'll transition, of course, Cameron Graham. Um, uh, uh, this, is, this question is, is our first, and we'll sort of just move from there and see where the conversation takes us. Uh, so, uh, what generally, in your view, has been the effect of the 2016 presidential election? Not just Trump's victory, but also, of course, um, Clinton's loss and the significant rise of Bernie Sanders and the significance that those two things have, I think, for the Democratic Party. In light of all this, what has the significance of the election been on the work you do? So for Sarah and Bhaskar and David, what has it meant for the kind of writing and editing you do on the left? And for Dan and Ingrid and Winston, same question to you as conservatives. How has your work changed or reacted to the post-election 2016 tenor of political and cultural debate in America? Are you going to call on us? Oh, or just, or just uh, whoever wants to run first. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for having all of us and for that incredibly lovely introduction. It's wonderful to be here. And I am a native Michigander, so I'm especially happy to be here. Um, and I was telling you before, but, but back in college, I studied the Southern agrarians, which led me to consider many conservatives who had critiques of unfettered capitalism, including Russell Kirk, um, as well as Genovese, Lash, um, and other great thinkers, and so it was wonderful to be invited here in particular, um, even if we are uh, located under the name of DeVos, which, um, <laughs> you know, despite her best attempts not to get appointed to the cabinet, um, we uh, will be seeing for some time. So, um, <coughs> the, the, the election, I, I just want to start by saying, and I, you know, my, my colleagues have, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing um, what they say. But um, I think it's worth saying from the beginning that we would rather have been fighting Hillary from the left than Trump. Um, because there is, there is a difference, right? And I want to lay that out because that's often an accusation that's made of the left is that we can't tell the difference between anything to our right. And I think that's not true. Um, because one of the advantages of being in debate with liberals is that they claim to have many of the same goals that we have, say, giving people health care. And we can say, well, if you really believe that, then you have to do X. You have to have single payer. Um, and that, that's a debate in which you have traction. Um, you have less traction, obviously, when it comes to debating um, the right wing of the Republican Party. And further, the things that will be produced by the right wing of the Republican Party will be things that make our lives harder. They make it harder to organize, whether that's 
a right-wing Supreme Court that messes up our politics, that means we have to fight over the fundamental right to abortion, et cetera. Um, and so that is, that is a real increase in our challenge. The upside is that it has been incredibly energizing for the left, um, and that's just <coughs> one tide of many that has sort of surged since Occupy, I would argue, through the movement for black lives and up through the Bernie Sanders campaign. And in many ways, it's great to be a socialist right now. Um, you know, DSA has doubled its membership. Um, more young people favor socialism than capitalism. Even the Pope doesn't like capitalism. Um, and in fact, has made specifically against trickle-down economics, which I appreciate. Um, and so in that sense, there's a level of momentum that is sort of attempting to fill in this gap that clearly exists between um, people's desire for political representation and what is actually on offer, which was clearly found to be <coughs> lacking left of center. Um, and of course, Hillary won the popular vote, but she lost the election to Trump, not just to any conservative, right? So we have to consider you know, the fact that with increasing political inequality, we have increasing, with increasing economic inequality, we have increasing political inequality. And so that is a huge vacuum that the left is working very hard to fill. Yeah, um, well, yeah, again, thank you for, for having us. I, I think it's funny because um, when I was a young socialist in, in college, uh, two of the people on the left that I were in, was in contact with was David and, and Sarah. And a lot of our mutual points of references were actually conservative thinkers. And like my point of reference when I started in Jackson was like National Review and not anything on the left. So I think it's kind of funny that we're now in conversations with conservatives. Though it might annoy them. Like it annoys me when, when Bannon says that he's a Leninist. I'm like, you have no idea what Lenin means or whatnot. So I'll, I'll return the favor. <laughs> and, um, now, you know, I, I think. The prime, one of the main results of the election was seeing that there's actually no political force in American society that actually has a mandate, right? Trump was, whether you like him or, or don't like him, he was a third choice of American workers, at least, uh, behind uh, not voting and voting for Hillary Clinton. Um, Hillary Clinton, the Democratic center, has been widely discredited. If you look at popularity ratings, it's quite you know, low. Um, Bernie Sanders, of course, is now kind of the last person standing and that he's the most popular politician in the United States. But even though we can imagine maybe a scenario in which a left populist becomes elected in 2020, it's very hard to imagine, it's actually almost impossible to imagine, a scenario where someone with Bernie Sanders' politics is able to assemble a kind of governing coalition that could actually legislate the things that he, he wants. So we're kind of at, a, at an impasse. Um, and my fear is that, you know, the failures of, of Trump, um, even by his own measures, to live up to some of his populist promises and whatnot, and maybe even his defeat in 2020, which seems very possible, if not likely, will just further lead a portion of his base down um, the kind of path to kind of more dangerous form of right populism. Uh, that's why I'm always very careful to not call Trump a fascist or any of this hyperbolic rhetoric, because I think that um, when we you know, actually see more radical forces on the, the right in the US, when we even see a force, not even fascism, but a force like Le Pen, you know, a US version of that, it will be much more dangerous and it will be a much more potent form of ethno-nationalist kind of xenophobia in such a way that we don't actually see in the US. The, my, my parents came to the, um, uh, the United States around nine, 10 months before I was uh, born. Uh, but I imagine if you poll even the most ardent of the kind of Trump um, right, 98% um, of them would not doubt my right to be an American, an American citizen, and identify that way. Um, whereas even on the European center right, the same can't be safe, said for the French or German center right, um, where legally and otherwise, um, I, you know, I wouldn't uh, claim the right to be an American, I might live in kind of a, a ghettoized community in the suburbs of Berlin or Paris. You know, uh, uh, the radicalism that I might have been indoctrinated with might have not been, you know, the kind of radicalism of um, Leon Trotsky or Michael Harrington, but but uh, you know, a very different kind of um, radicalism. So, in other words, my fear of the current moment is that the neoliberal center, for lack of a better word. Um, is capable maybe of defeating someone like Trump, who's gaff prone, and even his supporters occasionally kind of 
have to blush at the things he says, but unable to defeat Trumpism. But Trumpism isn't actually capable of delivering what it says it can deliver to uh, many of the um, American workers and struggling middle class people that voted for him. So we almost are at an impasse. And those of us on the left have no um, real serious program to, or even desire to reach uh, most ordinary Americans. Um, so Sa Bernie, Bernie Sanders and his message and his campaign is obviously my hope. But even then, I think there's a difference between you know, electing a left populist and like actually pushing through the, the basic demands of this kind of populism. So where does this leave Jacobin and our, on our tasks? I think uh, part of it is to establish a kind of third pole, to establish a type of anti-establishment sentiment that isn't on the right, but is on the left, uh, when able to communicate with everyday um, Americans. And like I said, I think Sanders was a glimmer of hope, but I think a lot of the left didn't really learn the lessons from Sanders, and, and you know, the, uh, I, I'm not sure that will change in the future. So perhaps a, a function of the three of us perhaps cutting our teeth uh, and coming of political age around the same time is that we might often agree <laughs> a bit. So I, I'll try not to repeat some of the things that Sarah and Bhaskar have already said, but uh, just to maybe emphasize some other points. I, I do think it's important, and the left has often forgotten about this, to, to remember that when liberals are in power, the left is also at its most powerful. Um, in the United States, the left has never really had power. Um, we, we live in, you know, as Hofstetter and, and Hartz and many other people have argued, we live in a fundamentally liberal society. And so the left is often most effective when there are progressives and liberals in power to, who can listen to them. Uh, so I don't think there's any celebration on the left uh, with about the, the rise of Trump. And in fact, I think it, it puts us on the defensive in a very scary way. Um, in fact, just to, to illustrate this, I think over the past seven, eight years, ten years, the left has really thrived in a way that it hasn't in, in probably three or four decades. Um, this may be the product of probably the three of us having the, the short-sightedness of having not had experience in the 90s or the 70s or 80s, but I think the period under Obama helped the left clarify its critique of the liberal center. Um, the, the 2008 crash also gave us the experience of what uh, a certain political economic system uh, meant for on our livelihoods, on the, the ways in which we can find employment, the ways in which the system is actually constricted opportunity. Um, and so I think over the past seven, eight years, we've really seen a kind of thriving left. Um, and I don't think, and it's often been framed that Bernie helped enable this left uh, to, to come into the, the public, but I think he really was revealing an emerging majority, at least with, among young people, that was already kind of fomenting or, or consolidating beforehand. Um, so I think there's something very scary about this moment, at least from the perspective of the left. But with that said, I do think that things are up for grabs much more so than they were five, ten years ago. Uh, to, to quote from Gramsci, which is this, uh, you know, the over-invoked line that the old is dying and the new is yet to emerge, I do think we're in this moment. And to, to kind of get to the, answer, the question that, that uh, uh, started us off, I think this is where intellectuals come in. Um, I think intellectuals and critics and intellectual journalists and editors um, are at their most entrepreneurial and their most effective when they're in opposition, not when they're in power. Uh, in power, our ideas often die at the, the, the kind of threshold or the, the precipices of, ex of power and, and the exigencies that require us to make compromises. And so I think intellectuals right now can clarify uh, and offer diagnoses of what's emerged and the varieties of it, whether it's on the right and the left. Uh, and I think they can also begin to start offering the new metaphors and even the old ones, too. I, I think, you know, a couple weeks ago I was having lunch with a French journalist and she remarked to me, she's, she's of the left, and she said, it's bizarre that in the U.S. everyone's so excited by socialism and democratic socialism. She's like, socialism in France is this institution that we've, we are at once are sympathetic to all of the politics of it, but frustrated by its formal expression. Why not come up with a new rubric, a new uh, 
way of thinking. And I would say in the United States, socialism has had to reinvent itself over and over again. Uh, and so, if anything, that we need to give new metaphors and new meanings to actually the things that we, we already believe to be of value. So I think what the role of intellectuals today is right now to both diagnose and perhaps even offer new ideas. So it's a parallel, there are two roles, criticism and perhaps even new forms of argumentation. But. Maybe we start with Dan and just sort of move that here. Well, the uh, American conservative magazine and the general style of uh, thought that's associated with it is in the unusual position of, of having been uh, basically Trumpist in many respects uh, long before Donald Trump was involved in politics. So uh, when it comes to economic nationalism, for example, when it comes to uh, at least the idea of an America first foreign policy, and when it comes to uh, immigration restriction, all of these were themes that I was exploring uh, more than a decade ago and that many of my colleagues were as well. Um, so now I'm in the unusual position of having to evaluate a kind of premature victory that uh, you know I didn't see Trump coming and uh, having him in office and now having to um, you know, see whether or not these themes can be translated into policy is um, kind of a new challenge for me, a new, a new source of uh, sort of interest in uh, the work that I do. And uh, in terms of exactly how that applies to my work, uh, one thing I have to do now is to um, reach out quite broadly and kind of explain what uh, Trump might be trying to achieve with these policies and with these themes, while at the same time also pointing out that the logic of these arguments stands apart from any particular candidate and uh, a political official. Um, I think one of the great mistakes that movement conservatism made over the years was to invest far too much in individual um, political leaders and personalities. Uh, it's really the issues, it's really the themes and ideas that matter the most. So that's, that's uh, an important distinction that one has to maintain at this point. On the one hand, some of our ideas now seem to have more uh, prospect of being enacted than before. But on the other hand, um, you know, we have a, a leader who is uh, rather inconsistent and who has you know, a lot of baggage and who um, you know, may or may not really be devoted to the themes that he had talked about during the campaign. Uh, two other uh, aspects of uh, my work that has had to change uh, with the new administration, um, first of all, is to think more about policy and policy implementation as opposed to having a critique of the policies that both um, conventional conservatives and conventional Republicans like George W. Bush and also liberal Democrats like Barack Obama had been pursuing. Uh, at this point now, there's a need to think not only about how a uh, right-wing populist might criticize um, the uh, political establishment, but rather what you do as a right-wing populist of sorts once you get in power. And this is a question which um, you know, one has academically thought about perhaps, but now has a, a certain uh, concrete salience to it. And finally, there's a need to um, sort of revisit history and also deepen the theory uh, behind this kind of populism and this kind of uh, um, uh, new conservatism. Uh, that you, you've seen, so, uh, for example, uh, the creation of a number of new theoretical journals and other outlets that are trying to explore these ideas. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, yesterday, for example, American Affairs, which is a new quarterly journal that's attempting to do so. Um, so basically, it's, it's a very, uh, on the one hand, some of our ideas and themes um, are very familiar now to people who uh, are accustomed to watching uh, Donald Trump. But on the, on the other hand, the actual sort of subtlety, nuance, depth, and uh, sobriety of our ideas is perhaps uh, less appreciated than ever. So that is the uh, main challenge that I'm facing. I very much appreciate where Daniel left off and I'll try to pick up uh, right where he left off. Uh, first though, please let me add my thanks for the invitation uh, to be here today. And also I'd like to say that um, I do have the privilege of being associated with a variety of nonprofit groups and organizations. I'm obliged on behalf of all of them to say that I speak here only for myself. Um, it seems to me that well, the underlying theme that we're all sort of hinting at is that essentially uh, the principal result of 2016 election was one of disruption. And disruption is a sort of phrase and even a kind of category of analysis that might more uh, naturally fall into a kind of progressive paradigm. I think, however, we see in the conservative world of ideas, uh, not the, so much the political world, although we're seeing plenty of disruption there too, but in the conservative world of ideas, which is, which is the natural world that I have worked in um, since the late 1980s, there is as much disruption going on there uh, as there is in the political arena. Um, many of the debates in the broader conservative world of ideas that will be ongoing, many of which Daniel 
Winston and others in the room are contributing to, um, require a long-term view of analysis and identification of solutions. And one of the principal uh, challenges, I think, that, for example, the conservative think tank world uh, and indeed the conservative foundation world, um, which were my sort of uh, direct homes, will be how to maintain a debate about immediate current policy uh, requirements and needs with this notion that for a long time there was a perception that the conservative world had a particular strength in taking the long-term world of making investments in young people who were going to be active in the conservative world of ideas. So we have some timing questions. We have some pressures, I think, that are generated largely uh, from the social media age that require um, very quick identification of solutions um, to these disruptive sort of elements that are going to take a lot longer to figure out. And frankly, I think some of these challenges for the long-term, short-term view tension exist on the left as well. Um, I'll leave it there for the moment and come back to some of these points later. Um, at the imagine of conservative, I would say that really the election of Trump doesn't make much difference to us. Um, and that's because our primary mission is to pursue the true, the good, and the beautiful in everything we publish. And uh, that means we focus primarily on culture and the arts and, and, and books and higher learning um, and publishing our favorite poetry. And um, we try to limit politics to not more than 15 to 20 percent of what we publish. Um, that's intentional. I think the culture has uh, been corrupted uh, by politicization. Uh, we've made uh, politics in this country uh, right after the NFL is the most important sport. Um, and you have your team and you wear red and I have my team and I wear blue or vice versa. And we cheer each other on and we, uh, uh, we bemoan the evils of the quarterback of the other team while our uh, team uh, has a wonderful hero who will lead us to all glory and love and laughter. And the answer is that's never going to be true. Uh, politics does not solve the needs of the human heart and never will. Um, it's a distraction from the things that we uh, should focus on in our own uh, families and our pursuit of the things that actually uh, grow uh, us as human beings. So I think politics is, a, is something we, we talk about because it's an important uh, aspect of our society. Uh, generally, uh, other than the entertainment value of it, uh, the vast majority of us wouldn't have anything to do with it if they didn't keep taking our money or spending our money in some way we didn't like. Um, that doesn't make it joy, that makes it a defensive measure. Um, and I don't, I'd rather stay on the offensive. And so for our publication, I mean, we, we had articles about the election coming into it. Some people were very pro-Trump, some people were never Trumpers. Um, as, an, as a journal, we did not take a, a stand on that. I mean, I have my own views, but I didn't publish them, partly because I didn't want people to think there is an imaginative conservative view. We have only over 600 authors. We published over 5,000 essays. There isn't one view on our website, and that's very intentional. Um, so I would say that, to answer your question, we haven't changed what we do. We continue to pursue what we think is the most important uh, aspect of the human condition, uh, which is finding the true, the good, and the beautiful in our lives. And I don't think Donald Trump has much to do with that for us. <laughs> so, uh, so there are so many themes that I want to run with. Um, in fact, I've been trying to think of follow-up questions to a variety of the things uh, that have been touched on, and I feel like to, to follow any one path would do it sort of disservice to the others, but I will just have to do it. Um, so I suppose then I'll, I'll, choose, I'll go with a specific question first, and I'll just put it to one person on each side, and then perhaps after that we could, um, we could sort of change it up again. I, I have a question that actually just relates to something that you just said, Winston, or actually to all of your remarks. Um, so as you say, you run the online journal of conservative thought, the imaginative conservative. Um, uh, visiting the website, as you say, any reader would immediately notice that your journal takes up not just politics, but also culture, um, literature, the arts, philosophy. Um, what thoughts do you have about the importance of, a, of, of, of going beyond policy debates into discussion of literature and aesthetics? What Im importance do you think that that has for a movement like conservatism? And do you think that literature and aesthetics are in some sense fundamentally political at all? And actually, right before I have you answer that, I might just put a question to David as well. Um, so, so David, a related question. 
uh, you edit the literary section of the nation. <coughs> when you sit down to edit or to call for articles, do you think of the work you're doing as serving a definably political purpose? Um, if so, to what extent and in what particular way? So I'll put it to Winston and then perhaps David could respond. Um, no, uh, I think politics, literature, music, the arts, um, they can always contain a political aspect as politics is part of the lives of the people who make the art and who view the art. Um, I think uh, if someone approaches any of those things with a political agenda, nine times out of 10, they're just a really bad artist. Um, you know, we have this thing in some of the communities now, and, and I'm not criticizing anybody in particular, where we talk about, oh, is this a Christian movie? Well, normally the answer, if the answer to that is yes, it means it's not a very good movie, but it's got a message. Well, we, we have to be great artists first. So if you tell me you're a conservative who likes to make movies, and I have a friend who's a director who doesn't want to be known as conservative because it would hurt his career in Hollywood, but he doesn't want to make conservative movies, he wants to make movies that are well done, that are well acted, that are well written. Um, I would hope that an artist or a composer, um, a poet, would do the same thing. Um, and it's, they wouldn't exclude politics because it's part of the human condition. Um, but if they focus exclusively on it, I would say nine times out of 10, it's just gonna be done badly. And the last thing I ever wanna do in our journal is do uh, things, do art, do music, do books, do culture, even do politics badly. Um, and three quarters of the current debates and publications, my goodness, they're not worth reading and they're not worth thinking about. I mean, let's have serious discussions of real thought uh, of importance. Uh, let's, let, let's not argue uh, the kind of superficial you know, debates over you know, whether a guy made, you know, so somebody made a, a lot of money for a speech. I, I don't care how much money people make for a speech. What I actually care about was in the speech. And if the speech was bad, then it doesn't matter how much you got paid for it, it was a bad speech. And if, this, and if you got nothing for it, um, which is actually what the majority of speeches get paid, um, and it was really good, then it was a better speech. The, the, the price tag does not determine value. And that's something that we as human beings should always remember, is that the dollar sign next to something does not determine the value of it. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do in all of our work, and as I would consider us a site for literature and the arts, in addition to politics and economics and history and other things, I would say if we do them really well and our writers do them really well, then I don't care if I agree with them or not. Um, some of our writers voted for Trump. Some of our writers voted for Ted Cruz. Some of our writers, I know one of my favorite writers on our site voted for Barack, Barack Obama twice. That would be hard to explain to a lot of conservatives, um, and yet she can do it better than any of uh, anyone I know. So. I'm not as interested in kind of making everything we do into an ideological question. How about it's a question of quality and a question of beauty? And if we can stay there, I, I think, frankly, it's a lot more interesting. So I, I suspect uh, a fissure is already developing from the, the stage left and stage right. Um, I, I certainly think, and in the history of literary criticism, which has often been a site for hotly contested ideological debate, there's been a reduction of art, of creative expression, of literature into vehicles for conveying a certain political point of view, a certain argument. Um, certainly, the left has been the culprits of this as much as maybe the right. There's a certain way of doing a Marxist literary criticism that is very overdetermined in the way that it might read a text as being representative of someone's class or of the nature of a political economic system. With that said, though, um, I'll have to disagree, and I think that it's often a misreading of confusing the criticism of art with art itself. Um, I think all culture is, of course, political. If politics is about the debate and the description of the way we live communally, um, and culture and literature are ways of giving meaning to our lives. Uh, T.S. Eliot and Joyce and a variety of other people were political by also avoiding politics too. A certain aversion from politics and culture is also a way of uh, giving sanction to status quo politics and hierarchies. Um, in, in particular in terms of what I do with my section though, which is slightly different, 
that being literary editor is maybe a, a somewhat confusing title, because um, primarily my purview is editing the back of the book, which is a site for a very discreet and unique form of political and cultural criticism. Um, and I think in many ways, it was, you know, we call them book reviews or film reviews, but if you look at the, the nation, the New Republic, uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, the, the, the reviews were actually, or even the little magazines like Dissent or Partisan Review, they were very short. Uh, they are 800 to 1,000 to, to 2,000 words. And I think moving forward into the 1950s and 1960s, and the New York Review kind of helped solidify this, uh, back of the book writing and in general book reviewing became review essays and they became argument driven as opposed to descriptive. And so I see what actually I'm doing at The Nation is a lot like what I was doing at Descent. Um, it's an effort to use different human expressions that are in the world uh, as mechanisms to make arguments, um, to make persuasive arguments in different modes. Um, so whether I, I see there's a political purpose to my section, I, I, one of the great li liberating things uh, about the nation is it's a much bigger tent than dissent. Dissent was kind of an anti-sectarian sect, even though it never always recognized it, and that might make Irving Howe a bit frustrated if I describe it as such. But the nation, I can publish people whose politics I don't necessarily agree with, but I do think politics are always there, and I'm often suspicious of a reading of a piece of literature without any context. Um, it might be my historian background, but everything emerges out of a moment, even in resistance to it. Um, so in terms of what I see the political uh, mandate of the back of the book being, I see it more as bringing the ideas that are often developing in a variety of smaller communities, whether it's and Jacobin now is not a small community by any means, but maybe dissent still is, whether it's the little magazines uh, or the, the growing community of New York and uh, left intellectuals that are emerging, or it's academics too. You know, a historian brings to bear to the public their expertise, the conversations they are having with their peers and, and elucidates on some contemporary problem. So that to me seems to be the the political mandate, which is more of an educational thing than an ideological one. But I do think culture is absolutely a site for intellectual fisticuffs and, and conflict. And I would resist, and perhaps, uh, Winston, you can push back or someone else wants to, but I would resist the idea of thinking of it as a kind of platonic realm of beauty when, in fact, it's also a way of giving meaning to where we are today. Yeah, let me yeah, just really quickly. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I really disagree with you. Um, and I disagree, and it's not it's not just you. There's people, plenty of people on the right who want to politicize everything too. Um, we don't live for politics. Politics is a, essentially a, a way of understanding the human condition, but it's a way of understanding. Art is a way of understanding the human condition. Um, poetry is a way of hum, of understanding the human condition. I don't want if I put everything through my political lens, which, which, if I'm quoting you correctly, I think what you just said is, either we write about politics or we don't, but when we don't, it's a political statement. So in other words, your answer is, it's all politics, all the time, and it doesn't matter what you do. And when I look into the eyes of my grandchildren, I am not thinking politically, and I don't think either are they. And I think we were all the smaller for it if we start thinking immediately about the political future of our children before we let the love flow into our hearts. Now we have hearts, we, do, we have pocketbooks, we have rights that have to be defended in the court of law. I, I mean, I don't deny that. But I do deny that man is primarily a political animal. I think man is primarily, first and foremost, an animal of love. And politics is not about love, it's another tool. Economics, the way we practice it, is not about love, it's another tool. So I think we should put things in the right places. So. I do disagree with you, but it's okay. That's why we're on two different sides. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I won't add much more to this, um, but I would just note that um, part of loving the people around you is creating a world in which you would want them to live. And I think when, for example, you organize with uh, people in your neighborhood to save a park, 
it's community and it's love and it's something beautiful. And furthermore, um, the great sort of socialist mandate is to create a world in which everyone has enough such that people have freedom to express their true <coughs> human potential. And so if we think that everybody should be able to participate in creating things that are beautiful, that people should be able to write, that people should be able to, you know, I, it's hard not to paraphrase Marx here, but, um, you know, perhaps to only work in the morning, but write the novel maybe in the evening. Um, then we, of course, care about politics um, because we care about people having enough. We care about distribution. We care about all of these questions, which I think organizing towards can be quite a fulfilling human experience, but I would not try to guess someone else's feelings. The outcome is certainly fundamental to whether we can produce beauty and whether people can participate in it. Uh, and just one correction, too, or, or clarification as to what I was saying. I don't actually believe everything is political. In fact, I would worry if our personal lives, if our intimate relations, if our families, if the, that domain that, you know, as you, you mentioned, you kind of implicitly invoked uh, Aristotle, as Aristotle understands it, that domain is actually not in the public. But culture is in the public. Culture is human expression to be shared. And so there is always, you're always working your way into a realm in which there is a, a conflicting views as to how one sees the world. I also think Sarah's point is also correct too. Socialists care about individuality. We care about I individual flourishing and part of actually the, the politics around culture, the political economy around culture is, or the argument at least, is that without rethinking the distribution of income without rethinking the distribution of social goods, we can't flourish, we can't create beauty. We can't even have those domestic lives that shouldn't be political. So politics is a, it moves in a variety of ways. And so I would resist it invading the way that you might love a grandchild. But I do think culture and poetry, which are things that are meant for the world, meant for the public, are inherently related to politics as well. So I'd like to put, just in the interest of time, I'd like to put a question uh, to this table and then a question to that table, um, both of which um, I think in a sense are about this idea of fusion, um, which Dan, we've talked about before, Frank Meyer's fusionism. Um, uh, so I, I'll just, I'll start this way. So you each lead either a conservative magazine or a journal or a think tank. Dan's conservative journal started as a challenge uh, to the neoconservatism of the Bush years. Um, Winston's journal emphasizes, as, as you were saying, a kind of conservatism of cultural and intellectual uh, tradition along the lines of Russell Kirk and uh, Edmund Burke. And Ingrid, your think tank, uh, the Archbridge Institute, seeks to, quote, lift barriers to economic mobility by embracing principles of personal responsibility, rule of law, and entrepreneurship. So each of these missions are linked in some sense, to be sure, but their variety does, I think, point to the fact that conservatism as a concept can and has meant a number of different things in American politics. Given these different meanings, do you think it's necessary for a certain fusion of the varieties of conservatism uh, to occur, uh, especially given the intense debate over the very term conservatism that Trump's victory has in many ways affected or led to? And do you think of your work at all as being in service of some kind of fusion? Well, I think uh, fusionism is a very uh, widely misunderstood concept. Uh, Frank Meyer, who was literary editor of National Review for a long time, uh, he did not set out to take two disparate elements and simply put them into a political coalition together, those elements being uh, the kind of libertarian tendency on the right and uh, the traditionalist tendency. Rather, what Frank Meyer was trying to do was to show that there was a shared uh, philosophical mission involved in both the libertarian tendency and the traditionalist tendency. And that tension, the fact that you have two things that are also one thing, that they have a shared root, but they do sort of branch out in different ways, um, was one of the strengths of conservatism and was one of the strengths of fusionism. Because it gave you this balance and this tension. It gave you some space to think through uh, the fundamental questions and to um, you know, kind of weigh things dynamically. It was not just a checklist. It was something you really had to uh, work out for yourself. You had to do the math. And um, unfortunately, over time, the idea of fusionism tends to get reduced to a mere political coalition building. 
And uh, that is, you know, there's a place for that. Pol coalitions are the essence of politics. But that's not the philosophical objective that someone like Meyer was pursuing. Um, as far as um, where conservatism stands today, um, that mission is as important as ever, and it's a theoretical mission. It's a mission about going deeper than just uh, mere politics, but it's also not a mission that is purely cultural. It's a mission that tries to balance these different elements of the right, and by allowing a certain uh, free play of ideas, by allowing a certain uh, discourse and dialogue within the right itself, I think you actually get um, more clarification of your ideas. Yeah, some ideas you'll wind up finding, okay, they just can't be reconciled. Maybe there are things that are simply uh, really part of some other tradition, but it's worth, um, you know, continually having this dynamism in your mind in order to uh, strengthen yourself. Otherwise, what you wind up is with um, a rigidity and a brittleness, which I think um, all too many conservatives came to possess, uh, you know, uh, perhaps about 10 years ago under the Bush years, where you're simply following a leader, where you're simply robotically applying policies like cutting taxes regardless of whether or not it produces good outcomes for middle America. Um, any number of things like that are not really, uh, they're not philosophically sound, but they also wind up being very bad politics in the end. So by having a, a serious commitment to philosophy, a serious commitment to examining the different uh, threads and uh, elements of your tradition, I think you actually wind up being stronger, more honest, and also more politically effective. The notion of trying to redefine fusionism to suit this particular political moment is something that many conservatives and libertarians are looking at quite closely. And there is a lot of disagreement, as Dan alludes to, um, about what a sort of revised or new fusionism would look like or even if it can occur. I think one um, other way of possibly thinking about this on the conservative uh, sort of side of things is whether or not, rather than fusion, we should think about areas of new compatibilities. And that can be particularly true, for example, in the realm of political economy. Um, where you have as many discussions and, and even disagreements um, within conservative or libertarian circles about free market economics versus distributism, uh, what the actual effects of poverty relief are that are generated or not by the market. Uh, so within the philosophical family broadly defined, if you will, um, I think the notion of fusionism is, is a little bit uncomfortable at the moment. Um, and as Dan so rightly says, uh, the notion of sort of uh, a, a new kind of Frank Meyer part two um, may not be entirely uh, possible, but areas of compatibility of redefining um, yet retaining core common values and principles is entirely possible. And I think this kind of, of disruptive discussion, and I mean that in a positive way that's, that's occurring within the conservative world and the libertarian world, um, is, is, is going to have to address all of these kind of things. Um, and, and actually, I think um, our conservative and libertarian friends um, are gonna probably find that there's some areas where there, there may not uh, find the agreement that they may seek, um, not just on some of the social issues, but even in the realm of economics. Um, but I don't think at the same time on the conservative side of things, and there may be things that um, progressive colleagues uh, can draw in terms of synergies on their side, I don't think we should be afraid of having these conversations. You know, we, we are now uh, perhaps finally in a way coming to the end of the long 20th century um, you know, there, there are certain historians who talk about the long sort of 18th century extending well into the 1820s and 1830s, uh, where you had the knock-on effects of many of the revolutionary ideas in the Enlightenment, uh, in the French Enlightenment and the British Enlightenment, not really taking full effect, especially politically, until well into the 19th century. Well, we might be coming um, into a similar kind of understanding of the 20th century. So maybe around about now, we're getting to the time where we start to really see what the end of the Cold War really meant. It's been a generation. Um, I'm a Cold War kid. I lived through that. Did we really know what the end of all that meant in 1989 and 1998? No, we didn't. But now maybe we're sort of coming to the end of that. My point being is both on the conservative side and on the progressive side, I don't think we should be um, afraid of having our internal conversations. Um, and I think it's really very encouraging that the younger people, so I'm just going to be really crass here and just tell you how old I am. I'm 52. I don't think the people who are 10, 20, 30 years younger than I am who are coming into these intellectual spaces are afraid of having these arguments, and I think we should encourage them to do that. They might not do it in the context that we're familiar with. That's okay. I'm just, a, I guess I'm really responding partially to Dan. It's, I think we are rigid 
uh, we rigidly pursue the conservation of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Um, and that the human person has the capability to be in touch uh, with the fullness of their um, personhood. And that that is found in those things. It's probably for most of us not found in, uh, in materialism. It's probably not found in uh, um, either a radical communitarianism found in politics or a radical individualism found in politics. Um, so from that perspective, uh, we want to very rigidly preserve the best that has come before us and enhance that and add to it. Um, we find that for us that's probably not primarily going to be done in the political realm. Matter of fact, it's not going to primarily be done in the political realm. Um, and so, but we're, that means we're open to a dialogue, uh, whether it be uh, conservatives who uh, would share those values with us or uh, liberals who would share those values with us. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a bridge right now, I think, between some on the left who see kind of the, um, uh, the humane economy or the small is beautiful kind of economy um, with some of the folks on the right who might be more the distributist, uh, interested in distributism and some of those things, who say that part of the problem we have today is scale. Um, that it's not just big government, it's big business that's also a challenge uh, to the human person. Um, that when things are too big for the human person to, to comprehend in the scale of their day-to-day -day lives, that they're already part of their person, personhood is being taken away from them. Uh, so how can we change that? Um, there's different paths to get there. Um, you know, a conservative might want to uh, grow small businesses. Um, a, a, a liberal might want to break up big businesses. Uh, those are discussions to have. Um, but the whole, at the center of all of that is that the individual human person, the family, the community is respected and uh, encouraged to cooperate on the greatest basis possible. So when, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, I can't see the sign. Um, but when you were saying earlier that uh, uh, this idea that we come together in community, well, I think of that, I don't call that a liberal value or a conservative value, I call it a, a, a value of, of being uh, good human people who live in community and want to work together uh, to create a better lives for both their own families and for the families that surround them. Um, so if, if that's fusionism, then I'm for it. Um, if it's a fusionism of radical individualism and radical communitarianism, then I'm against it. So, so I imagine you might have some responses to what was just said. I'll put a question to you sort of that's related, I think, um, and then if you'd like to field it, great. If you also have some responses, that's great too. I, so I'll put it to Bhaskar, um, but um, I'd like, in my final question, to sort of broaden it to um, all three of you. Uh, so Bhaskar, you came on the podcast um, not long ago and sort of in the middle of the conversation explored an idea that you referenced um, very early on in your remarks. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, well, first I'll ask you to sort of suffer through my quotation of you um, at length, uh, which is, yeah, 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 yeah. Can yeah. also do it in his voice? I could, I could, I was, I was thinking of it, but, but I can't. Um, uh, and then after, I'd like to sort of explore it with you and perhaps get um, all three of yours responses to it. So Bhaskar says on the podcast, um, if you want to hear it, you should subscribe. Um, <laughs> one of the ways I came to the idea of creating a publication in part was because of my interest in and engagement with the National Review. And that particular period of late 1950s, early 1960s conservatism and Frank Meyer's fusionist project around American conservatism. I find these thinkers extremely useful, but in order to do so, I had to read them on their own terms. The US conservative movement was isolated and marginalized at mid-century. Their ability to crawl out of it can be an inspiration for the left. The idea of taking what seems to be kind of separate and competing constituencies and reweaving them behind a common project is fundamentally, I think, one of the missions of the left and one of the missions of the publications of the left. I like to think that Jacobin is contributing in a way to that effort to stitch together something to the left of liberalism. So I'm wondering if you could expand on what you, what you mean here. Um, when you started Jacobin, did you feel that the position of socialist perspectives in American politics had become marginalized to the same degree as conservative perspectives had during the mid 20th century? And then I suppose for the entire panel, um, what kinds of fusion has your own intellectual and political project necessitated? So first to Bhaskar and then the group. Uh, I do not recall that. Um, <laughs> you sort of said something have, like that. If you me. have an audio evidence of it, then, I do. You know, we can dispute that later. Um, so you know, you know. On, on the one hand, I, I would just say that I think that 
instead of looking, if you look at the, a lot of the history of the left, you're looking at a history of like, a weakness and marginality in the US, right? The left the, is the exception, not the rule. The greatest left or proto left that I think we had was the left that, that helped um, you know, abolish slavery in this country that, that emerged in that, you know, the period before the Civil War and in Reconstruction. And since then, you know, we had our brief moments, but it's been more the exception than the rule. Why? I think not because workers are confused, but because they're, they're rational, right? So um, workers are dependent on capitalists, and capitalists are dependent on workers, but it's an asymmetrical dependency. An individual worker needs the stability of their firm and their employment more than any individual capitalist needs a worker. So if times are tough and your boss is bad, but you're in conditions of high unemployment or insecurity or whatnot, you should just probably keep your head down and try to fill in any gaps through relying on your kinship networks, your friends, your families, you know, things like, like that. That to me is perfectly rational. The, the you know, workers um, turning to a left today would be completely, that would put me into more crisis than the continued um, seeming acquiescence or as some Marxists would say, false consciousness of workers. It would put me into crisis if they did something that's irrational because agree or disagree with it, you know, a lot of our, the premises of our thought is based on, you know, 19th century rationalism. Um, so, but as, as far as fusionism, you know, so I think it is a model for, you know, how do you, we, I think especially young people think of conservatives as being always a, the dominant force, but I think if you look in the scope of US history, the scope of the 20th century, then you see a certain form of liberalism is in fact being dominant. Um, and I look at, you know, people like George C. Nash and others that were locked out of liberal academia. Um, so when the left seeks, seeks refuge in academia um, in various forms and, and see the preservation of its presence in academia as being an up no necessity because otherwise we'll lose the left entirely, you know, I look at the way that conservatives have been able to survive by building their own institutions through think tanks and foundations um, and other avenues. And I think about the history of, of the left and the workers' movement, which is largely a history outside the United States, but I think of Karl Kotsky, I think of Bernstein, I think of Luxembourg and Lenin, you know, agree or disagree with these people, they were no academics. You know, they developed their theoretical thought through mass parties that had its own organs that generated um, like ideas. Um, so that's, that's more what I was getting at, creating institutions outside and being able to build an opposition movement, also being able to see the the, the long haul, being able to see how certain defeats can in fact be more productive than, than victories, right? So, I, I, you know, this is a cliche, of course, and more than half of the National Review, you know, didn't actually, uh, you know, think that this was gonna usher in an inevitable victory ever, but, you know, a um, Goldwater defeat in 64 is more productive than our, a Rockefeller dis defeat, and certainly um, a Republican was gonna lose in that election. Um, um, so, as far as how it relates to Jacobin itself, we can't form a fusionist project partially because we don't even have the, the elements of it. So this is more, Jacobin is more of a pre-project, right? So can you have fusionism if 30 or 40% of the right in, in the 50s are virtues? Like no, and that's essentially our corollary on, on the left. So I think part of what we're, we're meaning to do is kind of preserve a set of ideas and also you know, defend, defend certain ideas that I think were unfairly um, under attack. For better or for worse, um, the left conquered around half of the world in the past um, century. Uh, if you, so the workers' movement, in other words, I think spawned three different camps. It spawned the forces of, of, of social democracy, uh, which of course ruled swaths of Europe and elsewhere. It helped spawn national liberation movements, that played a major role in building post-colonial states for, uh, with a mixed record. I think the record of social democracy, of course, far better. And then, of course, it, it spawned Bolshevism and later you know, Stalinism for largely ill. Um, but the actual form that we used, the form of building mass parties, was the thing that did this. Um, and when I was coming to the left, I was encountering a left that was increasingly anarchist and inflected. So in other words, we were told to throw away the form of the party, we were told to throw away the agency of the working class in favor of, um, you know, kind of forms of more decentralized, non-hierarchical organization that to me have yielded nothing but, you know, some, some nice urban food co-ops. Um, <laughs> so, 
so that, that was kind of initially the, the thinking. So I think of it as a, as a pre-project. But part of what we want to resuscitate is, in fact, a universalism. So in other words, uh, a lot of the left today, the left, let's say, inflected by post-colonial theory and whatnot, would say that there's no way that I can understand, um, much less you know, David can understand, what a Bengali peasant wants or, or feels like day to day. You know, I would say, on the face of it, that's ridiculous. Because a Bengali peasant you know, is a person. And people want, generally, the same things. They want security. They want prosperity. They want a chance of making a better life for them and their family. And I think unless you understand the world in those terms, it's impossible to actually build politics. A majoritarian politics meant to, one, define the many and define the few. And in our, in our version of politics, unite the many against the few once we, once we define them. So I, I think that's Jackman's role to kind of keep alive these ideas and not to win over people on the left, but to kind of flood them out. Um, you know, right now, we're still a very small publication. We have a circulation, a paid circulation of only 40,000. And to be honest, in the past six weeks, it's basically like it's leveled out. I think I'll reach 50, and then that'll be the plateau. I, if you caught me two months ago, I would have. Uh, I, I would have came here in a helicopter or something. I, I, was, uh, I was much more ambitious in the initial post-Trump um, you know, bump that we got. Um, but, but I think there is an important purpose in keeping alive these kind of core premises and trying to win over people. And also to relate to the mainstream and relate, relate to American society without kind of capitulating to it. Um, to some degree, of course, you can't convince people that you have a better way for a society to function if you have disdain for that society. So in other words, um, I think that a lot of Jackman contributors, a lot of Marxists in general, um, dislike the society that they live in a lot less than a lot of people who are uh, superficially more kind of agitated against it, but fundamentally don't have the same kind of deep critique of it. Um, so I think that's some of our purpose, to try to build a politics that is both radical, but also majoritarian. Um, and, and I think in many ways, despite the flaws of the, the campaign, uh, Bernie Sanders did show us that there is, at the very least, um, a form of social democratic politics that is based on a class antagonism that could win majoritarian support. And I think nothing else that has merged on the left has showed us that possibility. Um, like I said, I'm still very, um, doubtful in the prospects to build a coalition that could govern. Because it is ultimately easier to govern, um, at least in the interests of capital or some segments of capital, than it is um, against it. So when people talk, in other words, about the decline of the mass party in Europe um, and elsewhere as an apolitical kind of crisis of democracy, it really is a crisis of the left. Because right now, Theresa May is about to win an election um, with you know, the support of maybe even the high 40s in Britain, and conservative membership has continued to, to plunge, because they don't quite need the same forms the way, the way we do. We need to do something quite a bit complex, which is to tell people whose livelihoods are dependent on capitalism, who are dependent on the profitability of businesses and firms in their areas, they need to fight, of course, for day-to-day -day demands, but also they need to ultimately fight to overcome the system that they see and, in fact, correctly see is that goes hand in hand with their prosperity. So it is a very different task than what conservatives have to do. Um, it is arguably an impossible you know, task. But that's why I like to at least um, you know, kind of rest my, my mind by thinking in you know, um, uh, decades and centuries and not uh, months and years. Yeah, David, David and Sarah, any thoughts on this, um, this idea of? Uh of fusing various constituencies on the left, and whether you look to the history of conservatism in any manner as being instructive on that question. Um, yeah, um, so I mean, since we're admitting embarrassing affinities for conservatism, um, <laughs> the um, I, I like permanently checked out the volume of Buckley's columns from my college library because like no one wanted it apparently for four years, which I took as a vindication as well, I guess. But um, because of the sort of um, the energy and the creativity, but also the, the unapologeticness of those columns, which at the time was 
um, quite striking. Um, and and I, I enjoyed his, his chutzpah uh, very much. Um, so, um, <laughs> sorry. I, so what I would add is, is this. So the challenge on the left, which of course Bosco referred to, is that the right has all the money, so we have to have all the people. It's a lot harder, I would argue. Um, and one could argue it's never quite been done successfully. Um, and one of the th challenges that we're facing right now, of course, is that there is a large constituency of dissatisfied people in the US, as you can see from the fact that most people just didn't vote. Um, so when we say Donald Trump has this huge mandate from the American people, what does that say about us? That simply isn't true. Um, so we have this sort of rich terrain, but the challenge of organizing is immense. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing right now is just growing the number of people that are actually in organizations from which they can receive training, political education, from which they can learn to go out and do their own political organizing. Um, what's wonderful about DSA growing the way it has, even though it's still extremely small, um, is that these are people who are coming in who have a sense that something is wrong, but maybe don't have a, a particularly strong analysis of what that is. They have a sense, they liked what Bernie was saying, they kind of want to go down that path there. They seem, uh, what he says seems to explain their lives in a way that makes sense. Um, and in the same way that unions, back when they existed, used to do political education of their membership, and that's why people in union households were significantly more likely to vote for Democrats, um, Bringing people into organizations right now is serving that function. So that's one part of what we're doing. Um, and there are going to have to be a lot more of us and a lot more organizations before fusion is a tenable challenge. Um, but one thing that the left needs to grapple with in a substantial way and always has is race. And if you look at the makeup of DSA, it is like pretty white. Um, and if you look at one of the most influential and important movements to emerge in the last several years, it's the movement for black lives, right? Now, a, there's a lot in common between different strands of these movements um, left of center. So, um, for example, depending on which organization you're talking about within the movement for black lives, um, there's enormous affinity. So, um, the Black Youth Project 100, BYP 100, which started in Chicago, um, has a very strong class analysis, um, and they participated in getting rid of Anita Alvarez, a bad DA in Chicago, by coordinating with the teachers union there, among others. Um, that organization um, is a natural ally of an organization like DSA. DS, the platform that was put forward by the Movement for Black Lives has um, enormous affinity with what is put forward by DSA. Because of the different contexts from which these organizations emerge, um, the different languages they use to describe political analysis, um, as well as different social contexts, those organizations still have lots of distance between them, practically speaking. Um, and so a lot of the interesting work that's being done in, I would say, organizations like DSA is making sure that people who are coming in through that particular sort of left and getting that particular sort of political education are being dispatched to work on immigrants' rights issues, are being dispatched to work on policing issues, um, and so as to build trust within a left that is broader um, than even just you know the people who came in through the Sanders campaign who are important. If you look at Sanders, um, you know I love him to death. Uh, I would say on gender and race maybe had some strides to make, and he did during the campaign. Um, but one of the things that seemed notable to me was that the people who supported him from my generation have a much more natural fluency with those issues um, and with the reasons they matter for a class analysis than Bernie sometimes seemed to. Um, and so that generation coming up, I think, has a responsibility to really capitalize on that and make sure that the coalition we're building in America looks like America. And I think that's a big futurist challenge for the left going forward, which has often been fragmented by disputes over so-called identity politics. Um, and I think that is what is going to 
create the power that we need. Historically, whenever white workers and black workers truly get together and get organized, that's when the hammer comes down, and that's because that's powerful. Yeah, David, really quick, um, and then we'll yeah, do yeah. one more question, then we'll have a Q&A session. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the left, it, in part because it's often been out of power, has been fusionist from the beginning. You think about the history of socialism, it's romantic, it draws from the romantic tradition and the enlightenment tradition, it draws from the liberal tradition and the revolutionary tradition. Uh, I think in the United States in particular, this fusionism has just been imbricated in what the left identity is. If, as Bhaskar argues, and I'd like to think that there's a persuasive case to make this, the abolitionists were some of the first radical leftists, they merged uh, an idea of free labor with the politics of anti-slavery. Uh, they were taking two different critiques and finding ways to, to consolidate them. The, the populists, again, were doing something similar, and there was a social basis, too, industrial workers and farmers. The New Deal and the Popular Front, again, there's a kind of left liberalism there and a merging of working and middle class uh, constituents. And I think actually the left today, for quite some time it struggled. And I actually think the anarchism that was in its heyday in the 90s really spoke in a language that was not American uh, and was not persuading large numbers of people of its politics, which were inherently about the, the nature of American political economy, right? The, especially the anti-globalization movement. But I think if you think about, and you know, I, I really found this remarkable, um, being someone who really greatly ab admires Karl Polanyi and thinking about alternative forms of, of kind of socialist thought besides the, the Marxist tradition, people like Sanders and Warren are actually doing something of a fusionist politics themselves. Uh, Sanders speaks about healthcare education as rights. He's speaking, in, uh, granted you could even say he's just a New Deal liberal, but he's speaking in a language that is familiar to many of us. I think Warren also speaking in this language that is drawn from a Midwestern populism that could be right or left wing. Uh, and so I think the left has always been very good at being adaptive to thinking about how to convey politics that link into a tradition that's long standing to the particular moment. I don't think it's, it's fully succeeded yet at a point where it can be a majoritarian movement. Uh, and I think Sarah has actually really highlighted some of the very critical fissures that, in my mind, didn't seem to be necessary because maybe a different uh, vehicle or messenger for a democratic socialism would have been more sensitive to some of these things rather than learning as the campaign went along. But I do think that we're in a moment where the left is, look, the left and right do draw from liberal traditions even when they're criticizing the center and criticizing liberalism. Most people on the left and right respect procedural democracy. I don't know actually if our president does, but I know that most people on the right probably do. And I know that most of my colleagues on the left do. And so I think it's more about finding ways to continue to bring new, new things into the fusion as it, it grows. But I do think we're at a moment where there is this kind of synthesis or a dialectic taking place. So I uh, actually would just invite people to come up um, and we can start the Q&A session. And then perhaps if you have responses to each other, you might work them into your answers to questions. Oh, Ingrid, do you have a quick? Well, I, sorry, not, not to take up more than just a minute, but I'm thinking particularly about the younger people and indeed the appeal that Bernie Sanders had to so many of the young. Um, I've been spending some time in the last couple of months talking with younger libertarian and conservative people um, who've studied actually quite a lot of, of uh, Sanders' uh, speeches on college campuses and basically asked them, you know, where, where do you see some possible areas of commonality for discussion? Um, and, and it's not that surprising in the sense that some of this is just sheer common sense, but some of the things uh, that I've been hearing from the young people, and it, it may just be worth um, putting out here, um, is that they're intensely interested in the practical application of ideas to daily life, and they do seek a kind of rejuvenation of problem solving uh, in the political context, in the constitutional order, um, to actually create opportunity for good jobs. And this is equally a concern on the right as on the left, I think. Um, a lot of discussion about what, what does the nature of economic growth and ec economic opportunity um, actually mean at the current moment? What can the left and the right sort of learn uh, from each other about those kind of discussions? 
There's also a very deep concern, I think, among a lot of young conservative libertarians, uh, people basically on the center right, about the extent to which debate has deteriorated into violence and that we are losing uh, the ability as a society, as a civil order, for constructive, genuinely tolerant debate. Um, there's a lot of concerns about mass marching being the gut reaction to a lot of what's going on. What do we do about channeling the anger on all sides to more constructive ends? Um, and the other thing uh, that I actually hear from European friends um, is, and this is sort of an interesting question just, just historically speaking, and, and actually it's come up uh, just a little while ago, uh, in terms of what, what has the fate of social democracy in Europe actually been and what lessons can be drawn from that in a North American context? Um, what does the evidence actually tell us? Why are um, there such divisive elections pending in the UK and in France? You know, what is this sort of moment that we're in in the Western world generally, not just, of course, in the United States? Um, and I think that these are these are questions coming from all sides, um, and it's it's very helpful that the younger generation is taking this all very seriously. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I guess Ingrid just brought up something that actually has changed since uh, in the midst of and in the uh, result of the most recent election is we've spent more time talking about civility. Um, and the ability to have real conversation about issues as opposed to uh, sound bites and arguments uh, than we did uh, in previous years. And I think uh, one of the biggest challenges we have, and I, I, in just listening to what some of the things that were just said uh, uh, a moment ago, is I, I see that, uh, you know, screaming and, and signs, you know, uh, holding up signs that you can shake in front of a news camera, um, has a certain um, uh, visual effect that draws attention, but it's not persuasive. So the, part of the question we, I think we should be able to address between us is, well, first off, are we trying to just get our base angry and motivated? And if that's the case, then we should all yell at each other and call each other names because that's the thing the base seems to enjoy the most. But if we're trying to persuade the people that don't already agree with us, I think that demands an, a very different approach um, and for us, we want to spend more time trying to persuade people who might be open-minded uh, than we do uh, trying to just uh, get people to scream and be angry uh, at the opposition, which I don't think is really a viable approach. We can, we can go to questions. Yes, Professor Pistana. Uh, I have a question about uh, fusion. Uh, and if I recall correctly, in the late 1960s, there was talk about uh, a fusion between uh, ultra-left uh, anarchist communes and uh, ultra-right anarchist communes. And I've heard recently some talk from people about uh, possibility or uh, perhaps a hope that uh, the Tea Party movement and the Occupy Wall Street movement would fuse. Do you think there's any uh, possibilities there Um, yeah, in the 1960s, uh, libertarians especially reached out and wanted to work with the left, particularly on anti-war issues, and I think that continues to be uh, an area of common ground between uh, certainly many libertarians, many conservatives, and uh, much of the left. Um, it, it does become difficult because depending on who is in office, you will see different degrees of anti-war support. Uh, coming from uh, either the left or the right. There is a certain modulation that occurs based on whether a Democrat or a Republican is in office most of the time. Um, however, clearly there are people who are very principled who you know, take a firm stand against uh, you know, disastrous foreign policy, and uh, you find that on both the left and the right. You found that in the 1960s with regard to the Vietnam War, and you found that uh, during the Bush era as well. And um, you know, there were not... Um, not as many, uh, perhaps, uh, on the right who were aware of just how bad the uh, Iraq war was at the time. Some people actually on the right who were aware were not able to speak out because uh, sort of institutional controls and rigidity uh, of the, uh, the way the movement was structured, it prevented people from speaking their consciences. And I think that's something that the right always has to be able to preserve, uh, whether it's under the uh, you know, Bush administration or whether it's under the uh, Trump administration. So uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, 
Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, conceivably they could get together on certain anti-banking issues, conceivably they could get together on a critique of perhaps uh, Federal Reserve policy. Um, but that hasn't happened, and it does seem to me that um, one of the fissures that always emerged whenever libertarians and progressives tried to work together was the fact that they do just have fundamentally different ideas, not only of economics, but of political economy. And uh, that you know, is so uh, constitutive of the uh, outlooks of both libertarians and of uh, progressives that it prevents any kind of long-range amalgamation. So you can have it on uh, you know, issue to issue, but in terms of having something that fundamentally brings them together, it's very difficult. I just want to say briefly that I represent, I think, the fusionism that you guys were just talking about because I, I am both a former Bircher and a former Teamster. Um, and you guys uh, have been for one and against the other. So I think I've, I'm already representing a fusion of all things that you hate and love at the same time. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> um, I think we should not forget that the term alt-right was coined by Richard Spencer to disguise a form of sort of neo-Nazism. Um, so there's no common ground there. Um, and I think it's worth being definitive about that. Other forms of conservatism, I mean, I appreciate Daniel Larison's writing. I think a sort of anti-interventionist um, position potentially has overlap left and right. Um, and I think, um, to sort of return to something that was said earlier, I do want to be clear, there, there's been this sort of slippage where any time people march, it's described as violent or like an aggressive reaction. I think, I find that bizarre. Like, I, I don't see how marching is violent. It seems like the opposite to me. Um, and I also think it tends to operate on sort of a spectrum. So we're, the American media was very <coughs> proud of Egyptians for nonviolently protesting until their president was deposed. There were police stations on fire. I think if that were happening here, it might be considered violent, but it's over there, so, you know. Um, I think it's worth keeping in perspective that there is a range of political dissent um, and that to declare it violent is to try to fairly stringently limit what dissent can look like in this country. Um, further, I think when it comes to um, campus protest and that sort of thing, um, it's worth remembering, I think, for people on the left who your audience is. So it's not that there are strict principles about when you can and can't shout at someone who's speaking. It's, are you trying to organize more people to agree with you? Um, and if you are, often, um, you know, if you have someone who has like pretty objectionable positions but will be in dialogue with you in some way, sometimes the best thing to do is to actually know their work and get up there and ask a particularly devastating question or to have everyone line up and ask them like 90 really devastating questions or for that matter, to stand in front of them with an explanation of their views on a piece of paper. Whatever. Um, that can be one way to do it. Um, the person who has been in the news most controversially, obviously, although not anymore since he, nobody likes him anymore, is Milo. Um, and there you have a slightly different case where um, in, the, in his case, when he got up on stage, he would create direct threats to people in the audience. So he pointed at a transgender student and called them out by name um, and talked aggressively about them. And that, that's sort of unacceptable. And so when people get up and try to shut down that event, honestly, um, that seems not only somewhat reasonable, but has some amount of public opinion on their side because of how disgusting the thing that Milo did was. I think what's important in all of these cases is that you want to be thinking, okay, we have a bunch of left ideas. The purpose is not to convince Milo. I don't think Milo's coming over to our side. The purpose is not to convince Ann Coulter. The purpose is not to convince Charles Murray. I think he has a track record at this point. The point is to use them as platforms to communicate your ideas effectively to a large middle. And so whether your activities are doing that is the measure of whether you're doing the right thing. Um, and obviously, um, you know, terrible violence, like when a Milo supporter shot a Milo protester, uh, is unacceptable. And I think it would go without saying outside of the bounds of what I'm talking about. Um, 
Well, I, I, well, on the campus question, I agree with Sarah. I think there is a difference, and I think portions of the left are blurs between uh, racist persuasion and racist agitation. Um, I think racist persuasion is speech that should be protected. Racist agitation, in a certain sense, should not. Um, and, and I think it's dangerous in the left where's that line, but I think it's also, um, you know, been overstated to what extent there is like, you know, gangs of leftist militants. You know, it's not, you know, it's not even like the new left in the 60s, in which case I might be with Adorno who was trying to lecture and was being bothered and just called the cops and like, you know, uh, you know not, not necessarily uh, <laughs> a, a completely unsympathetic. But I do think there is, there is a, I could see, of course, you know, the, the difference between the alt-right and these elements around Bernie, the difference between Tea Party and Occupy, you know, a lot of it relates to a worldview perspective that's rooted in, you know, their different class positions and also what they want at the level of political economy. You know, what they want as far as what kind of redistribution they want, what kind of control over socially created wealth would they like to, to see. So I think there is a fundamental difference there. Where there is maybe some small degrees of worrying, um, uh, what I think to be worrying overlap is that I think in this era of social media and the era that we're in now, there's a tendency to just speak to your, your base um, and just to be kind of provocateurs trying to rile up and excite your base. And I think you see that on both the left and the right. So I, I put it this way. Um, you know, I come from an anti-Stalinist tradition. I'm no great um, you know, friend of, of the legacy of even American um, you know, uh, Communist Party, which of course is a much better domestic track record um, than they did when they, they had state power abroad. But at their, their peak of their power and influence in let's say the 1930s, they were in a sense hard at the core and soft on the edges. In other words, internally they had a rigor um, perhaps like a woodenness and how they viewed the world, but they, they, they trained, they discussed one another, they, they had a sense of purpose, they had goals, and they had a worldview. But then on the edges, they were soft. They were able to participate in broad mass fronts. They were able to communicate with hundreds of thousands and millions of ordinary people. I think in a way, there's a tendency in a lot of the new left to be almost like the opposite. They're very hard on the edges. They're very hostile and aggressive to people who might not immediately share all their, their thoughts and beliefs. But at the core, if you talk to them, they have no idea actually what they want, what they believe in, and how they view the world. It's kind of my goal to um, create more of a left that's kind of the opposite. Of course, not to the ends of, of, of supporting um, Uncle Joe and the Moscow trials, but to the ends of creating you know, a broad, expansive view of, of democratic socialism and making it relevant in the 21st century, I think we need a clear worldview and we need to have rigorous debate and discussion um, and education internally. But at the same time, we need to kind of embrace with open arms people we, who we could possibly win over. And when we engage with people we disagree with, we need to be clear that, like Sarah was saying, our goal is not necessarily win them over, but our goal is to look good in front of you know, an audience when we're, we're, we're doing it. And, and Irving Howe, who, who founded um, Dissent, used to refer to um, actually the communists in the 30s as kind of the brilliant masquerade. And his question basically was, can we create um, browderism without browder? In other words, can we do a lot of the things that the communists did well in that period, relate to and talk to ordinary Americans, embrace certain parts of this nation's uh, tradition and history, but without necessarily doing so for you know, sinister ends, but doing so because we you know, firmly believe that there can be some sort of, you know, emancipatory path out of, out of um, you know, from, from the basis of the society that we, we live in. So one, one final, I think we're approaching over time, so one final question from Professor Sahat, yes. And then just quick responses. Joe, we also have a question. Oh, we do, I'm sorry, and that, yeah, two, two final qu quick questions and then quick responses. Okay, quick question. Um, I'm, I'm, Surprised in a certain sense at the direction that the conversation has taken and the kind of deep disagreement that has emerged. And one of the things that I would think that the left and the right, or maybe far left or far right, and uh, can agree upon is 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 trade policy. 
and uh, economic nationalism. And I thought this, uh, perhaps wrongly, I'm seeing the shaking heads, but let me, let me, at the risk of unmasking myself as a Clintonian triangulator or something, um, it, it, it does seem that, that the hostility to NAFTA, the hostility to free trade, the desire to rewrite uh, trade agreements in the favor of, uh, well, labor, I assume, on the left, or some kind of more beneficial arrangement on the right, would seem to be something that, that the left and the right can come around, even if they would have different ultimate ends in renegotiating the, those agreements. Agree or disagree? Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I think there, there certainly are commonalities between the left and the right's critique of what we might call neoliberalism or a kind of post welfareist liberalism that emerged since the 1970s. Um, and I'll leave that to other panelists to also explicate or, or discuss in greater detail for the sake of, of keeping our comments short. But I think actually, in one thing, there, there's a tension that really can't be resolved. And if you think about actually the French election right now, and you think about Mélenchon on one end and Le Pen on the other end, Le Pen is talking about a welfare state, a very robust welfare state. Uh, Mélenchon is too. They're both Euroskeptics in many ways, which actually, at least from my left, I'm a little skeptical of that Euroskepticism. Um, but what I think really is distinctive between a Mélenchon and a Le Pen is the question of what their populism is after and what their economic nationalism is after and who the people are. And I think actually this is where the left and the right aren't going to be able to probably come to agreement. And I'm not proposing that the right on this side is th that right. Uh, but there is a right out there that defines the people in very exclusive terms, that has a very distinct ethno-nationalist understanding of the people that are going to benefit from a social democracy. And the left doesn't have that. The left has an inclusive understanding of, peop of the people. Um, and maybe I'm creating an unfair binary, but I think that's really mm -hmm. a, a spot where Mélenchon and Le Pen are not going to ever get come together. Uh, and I think if you look at the difference, both Bernie Sanders and, and Donald Trump were complaining about the, the billionaire classes or, or agents and elites who are usurping the American people of popular sovereignty. But the, the difference is that the popular part of that is defined differently. Um, and so I think that on that end, that, that's a real difficult thing for any kind of consolidation between a right and a left. And I think you even see it with the Tea Party and Occupy as well to kind of come back to that, that question. Right table already. Yeah, um, I would simply say that I think Baskar was correct uh, at the beginning of our panel when he said that uh, the right doesn't have quite the same kind of ethno-nationalism that you see in Le Pen and you see in France. And Americans are very confused about this. And I've written uh, recently for uh, uh, the week um, about uh, why um, you know economic nationalists and people who like uh, you know the kind of economic uh, populism. Uh, that we have uh, Donald Trump and others representing in America should not have sympathies for Le Pen. Um, Americans just do not understand the European situation, and that leads them into, um, you know, having a, you know, rooting on for someone like Le Pen. That's I think very, very dangerous. I can um, allude to two at least examples of uh, left and right cooperating on issues of trade. Uh, you, uh, my friends on the other side, may recall the uh, Battle of Seattle in 1999, which was against. Uh, you know, basically the whole neoliberal agenda that was going forward. And uh, Pat Buchanan was there. So, um, you know, that was an instance where there was some degree of... You make a shirt like that. <laughs> Pat Buchanan was there. And then also, uh, Ralph Nader uh, has been working on these issues, uh, you know, uh, for a very long time now. And Nader is very ecumenical. And he's reached out to me, he's reached out to a number of other conservatives who, um, you know, object to all sorts of things. I mean, you'd be amazed at what kinds of regulations, uh, what kinds of um, uh, sort of kangaroo courts, for example, are embedded in these uh, trade deals, where basically um, sovereignty is being taken away from American courts and they're being placed into um, sort of international courts or various other kinds of special arbitration panels, which are undemocratic, something the left doesn't like and conservatives don't really like either, uh, and are also anti-national, which is something that conservatives in particular have a very strong objection to. So um, I would point to Nader as being you know, a great example of someone who works very diligently um, to bring together uh, progressives and conservatives who are concerned about the economy and especially concerned about uh, trade deals that are terrible for sovereignty, terrible for democracy alike. One thing that, that I, would, I would mention, just on, on the particular issue of trade, I think 
protectionism is not necessarily progressive and free trade is not, is not necessarily um, you know, a product of the right. So if you look at our best example of the left in power constructing a society, you would look to Scandinavia or you know, Sweden of the 60s and 70s. These were systems built heavily around uh, free trade. Um, so, so, and you know, and the actual model that we have of the least governing doses of socialism within capitalism, it is largely a free trade um, model. So, so I think that our stance should be kind of uh, more neutral. That you know, we should be for maybe some trade deals, but against many, including many of the the recent ones, and not kind of draw it in in these kind of absolute terms. But you know, I would kind of just to, to wrap up on my end, just say. You know, I like an analogy that um, the John Trickett, the British um, MP, made uh, about his constituency. And he's, he's an old, he's a member of the Labour left, um, one of the most left-wing members of, of the um, Labour parliamentary group. Uh, but he's also, um, you know, from a working class background and in a working class district in Leeds where 97 or, or something ridiculous percent of his constituency voted leave. And the way that he explained it, and I, and I do think the Brexit vote is, is complicated. I might, have, uh, you know, I might have been tempted to vote leave myself if I was in Britain. I don't think it's as straightforward as manifestations of, of uh, right-wing populism like Le Pen is. But he said that his constituency feels like they're trapped in a runaway train, or at least a train that's moving faster and faster, and they don't know what direction it's going into. They don't even know if there's a conductor. They didn't really like where they started off, but at the very least, that's kind of the known evil, so a lot of them want to go back there. You know, I would take that analogy a bit further and say, what would you do if you were on a train like that? Well, chances are you would look around to the people in the same car as you, and you might link arms with them and form some sort of solidarity with them. The task of, I think, real left-wing politics is to convince people that, in fact, they're right to do that, and they should look around, though, and, or at least Imagine that even though there's no windows in this train, there's probably other cars and there's probably other people in the same situation as them and the people in their, their car. Uh, that they have a vested interest and they're going to the same destination as those people, so they have a vested interest in, in going together. And I think what is ultimately different about the left wing and the right wing worldview, or the socialist worldview and the conservative worldview, is that we want people on this train to have some sort of direction in where it's going, well, we kind of want to get there, too. And we want it, might want to get there even faster. Um, I think, in many ways, the left isn't the negation of liberalism. It isn't the negation of modernity. It's kind of the completion of, of liberalism. It's the completion of the like, values of the Enlightenment, the long frustrated values of <laughs> liberty, equality, and fraternity. Uh, the, the fact that these ideas have maybe been frustrated by the limitations and constraints of of class society, that maybe there's, there's a path of modernity uh, through other, other means, or at least that's our, our premise. So I think that's what's at core of our disagreement. And to the extent there is small c kind of conservative elements on, on the left, I'm not sure if they're really in the least the, the spirit of, of progress and modernity that I think is, is very intrinsic to at least the socialist left. And that I'm Annette Kirk, the uh, widow of Russell Kirk, and I was very pleased to hear you uh, speak today about his concern for unfettered capitalism, uh, which he was concerned for. He was also concerned very much about conservation, sometimes uh, that is not always looked at upon as a conservative uh, measure. But uh, this has sort of been deja vu for me because we were very involved in 1960s uh, in all of that discussion, the early discussion between the early uh, radical movement at that point, which wasn't yet violent. And so we were at Big Bear in 1964 when we had was it Mario Savio and all those people. They were up there and they were sitting there sort of as you are in 1964 and saying some of these very sensible, uh, uh, kind of intelligent, uh, very well spoken. And, uh, and we came away with this kind of a panel where we were all in agreement how we could agree and disagree very civilly. And then, of course, you know what happened in the 60s. And so I was very happy to hear you uh, mention Polanyi and that you didn't, which Russell always gave his students to read, and Robert Nisbet too. 
and I think we could agree on some of his uh, understandings of community. Uh, but um, I have not heard you speak about uh, uh, sort of organizing on the uh, style of Saul Alinsky, and how do you feel about that? Is that anything in your agenda, that kind of organizational? Are there any particular facets of it that you Well, I was thinking that Hillary was, um, you know, very keen and very much involved in the uh, kind of thing that Saul Alinsky was teaching people about classes and, and about society and such and, and how to infiltrate uh, the society to change it. And I wondered if there was any of that kind of measure. Well, this is a new. You're all new, perhaps, now. You're young and, and uh, have, uh, perhaps, imaginative ideas. Maybe you and Winston Elliott can <laughs> cooperate again. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. Virtue for Alinsky. I think I'm going to start that. <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to be the first Virtue for Alinsky, I, uh, I'll, I'll do make it. the website. Um, hmm. Well. You know, uh, the Alinsky comparison is an interesting one. I mean, um, it's funny, I went back to Rules for Radicals recently and I was reading it and I forgot how much of the book was just scolding 60s radicals for doing it wrong um, and uh, actually being alienating to most American people, you know, with their dirty counterculture and their hippie ways. Um, and it, it's a funny book in that sense. Um, I. Look, I mean, I think a lot of the organizing that you're seeing now, it ought to be very legible. I mean, people have certainly drawn lessons from Alinsky, who is a tremendous organizer. Um, but if you look at the different ways that people are organizing now, you'll see a, a very heavy media component. Um, if you look at the Movement for Black Lives, famously, you know, there's a tremendous social media presence, um, and this has good and bad qualities to it, good in the sense that you can create a very sizable constituency without a geographical majority <laughs> wherever you are, um, and that's been tremendously important. Um, it's very sophisticated in terms of how that movement communicates with the public and applies pressure that extends beyond the size of the people organizing it. Um, <coughs> And I think many of the media techniques are, are the same in that you use an election to bird dog politicians and you use them as a platform for your message. I mean, I actually thought um, Black Lives Matter was very effective at this by um, jumping onto Bernie's platform right at the beginning um, and then jumping onto Hillary's platform or trying to, um, following Trump around because cameras go with the candidates and so the organizers go with them. And by the end of the campaign, both Democratic candidates and Donald Trump felt like they had to talk constantly about police violence. Um, and this is just very effective political organizing, but it's just one piece of it. That's a very media-centric piece of it. Um, the door-to-door -door organizing is, I think, happening. I mean, a lot of the groups that uh, came together around the Bernie Sanders campaign have decided to stay together and now are organizing around local elections. Um, where I, I live in New York and upstate, um, there are a lot of rural communities and there are actually a sizable number of Bernie voters. And so there are brand new organizations up there in Kingston, for example, um, that are sort of beginning to branch out and work in the communities that they already know. Um, and I, I guess I'm wary of this language of infiltrating. I think there are a lot of ways in which people who do political organizing can be made to seem other so that they can be knocked out of the picture. And so when Trump talks about paid organizers, for example, or rather paid protesters, um, I, I love this because first of all, I wish someone would pay me to go to a protest. Um, and let me assure you that is uh, not a, a thing I have ever been offered. Um, but also because we have organizations, institutions, where we pay staff people to organize. That's part of building a political movement. That's true on the right as well. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> and so the idea that anyone who is paid to do politics is somehow illegitimate is, I think, sort of a contrived way of picking off um, people on the left and declaring them illegitimate. I think similarly with the idea of infiltration, I mean, from much of the organizing I've seen, it's people going out and communicating with their communities, you know? And I think 
that frequently the right um, sort of reframes that in language of infiltration in order to make the left seem alien to America, to make it seem like a foreign agent. It's, uh, it's very Cold War. And I think this is something that is not as much of a concern or a language for young people, um, in part because there aren't quite the same historical anxieties. Yeah, let's please give a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>